that's not what I wanted to talk about today. So today, I'm going to talk about I'm going to talk about Buddhism. That's what I always talk about. And it's such a, such a funny thing, this Buddhism thing. Not, not unique in its funniness. Christianity is also kind of funny. Islam is just as funny. Judaism. Hinduism is funny in its own ways. But by funny, I mean, what the heck is Buddhism, really? Right? Does anyone get that? Like, the, more you, the more you study Buddhism as an outsider, I think the more confused you get about what Buddhism actually is. I got in trouble recently. I'm probably still getting in trouble <laughs> for saying something. I can't even quite remember what I said, but some rather unflattering things about certain Mahayana Buddhist texts. But if you read those texts, you'd have a whole different idea about what Buddhism is. Completely different idea. Well, a much different idea of what Buddhism is than if you read the texts in my tradition. Different, whole different flavor to them. It's interesting how they carry over some of the some of the thematic uh, devices, and there's some paraphrases and similar manners of speaking, but the doctrine is so different. I mean, there are Buddhists who believe that there's a Buddha land where Buddhas are are waiting, are living, and where you can go and become enlightened. You can be reborn there. There are Buddhists who believe that you just do a bunch of chanting and everything you want comes to you. I mean, that's probably oversimplifying a little bit, but basically. There are Buddhists who believe in tantric sex as a religious practice. There are Buddhists who believe that killing and stealing are always wrong. Killing, stealing, lying, cheating drugs and alcohol are always wrong. And then there are Buddhists who believe that such things can be used for the right purposes. There are Buddhists who follow a historic Buddha. And there are Buddhist, Buddhas who, Buddhists who think that they are Buddhas or on a path to become a Buddha. There are people who claim to be enlightened there are Buddhists who claim that there is no such thing as enlightenment. There are Buddhists who believe in rebirth. There are Buddhists that don't believe in rebirth. I mean, it's not. I'm not probably saying anything too surprising because most religions are like this. But I think it's particularly problematic in Buddhism. It's really gone very, very far afield. I don't. I mean, I think. Take Christianity, for example. For the most part, they follow Jesus. Um, for the most part, follows Muhammad. And they just have different interpretations of what this historic dude said. Buddhism isn't like that. So many different ways of talking about what Buddhism means. And, and Buddhism, Buddhism and the idea of a Buddha means so many different things to me. Where I'm going with this is I'd like to try and, and with the qualifier that I am just one Buddhist teacher and obviously I don't represent any kind of the Buddhism or orthodox Buddhism. But I'd like to present to you 
something that I think is very core to Buddhism. And to that extent, important in order to be a pillar of bring ourselves in in India when they when they would build a city they would have something called the uh, Indra's pillar Indakila. So they and it what it meant is they put a I, mean, I don't know where the tradition came from but as I understand they put a, a pillar a solid pillar in the center of the city and that was sort of the inauguration of the building of the city or something like that Maybe it had something to do with the Ashokan pillars, but uh, Indakila became it. It's just a, something that uh, sort of is the the foundation of the city. That's the, the idea I'd like to give here is sort of a, a foundation thing to get your bearings uh, on use to get your bearings on the question is actually answerable at all. So in Buddhism we often hear about what are called the Four Noble Truths and this is probably one of the most widely agreed upon teachings uh, not by all schools I don't think but Oh, hey, maybe by all schools. Another thing, and another as one aspect of the the four, they may be more well equally important. So important, important to talk about in detail. So often we we say that. The Buddhist path or the Buddhist way of life has eight parts. And those eight parts sort of constitute, in a highly abbreviated form, what it means to practice as a Buddhist. Qualities of life that a Buddhist should. Eight things. And even that might seem a little bit onerous because you got well, eight things that you get around. But it's actually a lot easier than that. If you want to understand, it's even easier than eight. We've only actually got three things. And these are what the Buddha called the three trainings. In Buddhism, we strive to train ourselves. And, and when I say in Buddhism, I'm actually talking about my tradition because I don't know how the other traditions, so I can't speak for them. As a sort of a foundation path, we have three things that we train ourselves in. I think it's pretty common throughout Buddhist tradition. So the Eightfold Noble Path, you can separate it into three parts. We have what we call sila, or morality. Adi, which we call in terms of this focus. And banya, or wisdom. These are the Pali words, which are probably close to what the historic Buddha used to, they're probably close to the language of the Buddha himself. Sanskrit, there are other words, but the Buddha probably didn't speak Sanskrit. He wasn't a Brahmin, it wasn't his language. And Pali is almost Sanskrit anyway, but it's more of a common. We have Sila, Samadhi, Banya. Morality or ethics, concentration. And this is what I'd just like to go through today. Give you a good basic teaching for us to go through. Find, or if you find yourself getting overwhelmed and saying, what the heck is this Buddhism thing? Or, that's followers of the Buddha. So sila, morality, to understand it, we break it up into four parts. 
It's just one way of breaking it up, but it's a good way. The first one is we follow certain rules. So in my tradition, or and in most traditions, lay Buddhists will try to follow five precepts. Not to kill, not to steal, not to cheat, not to lie, and not to take drugs and alcohol. This is keeping rules. Now, morality isn't all about rules, but rules are useful. They are important. Rules are like fence posts. If you're trying to keep a horse in uh, fenced in, the first thing you need is fence posts. But then if you ask, are fence posts enough? If you put some fence posts in the ground, can you ever keep a horse contained? No. A lot of fence posts. Right. Which is true of rules as well. If you had enough rules, probably be pretty easy and that, that probably enough. Like monks have hundreds and hundreds of rules, so lots of fence posts. Makes it easier to see the boundaries. But it, it'll never be enough. Uh, there will always be holes between the fence posts, right? Fence posts are there to put up fences, but they aren't fences. Unless without fence posts, your fence will fall over. Without reality is weak, wavers, it shakes, it falls over. So the first part is keeping rules. Second part of morality is, and I'm probably going to get the order wrong, but it's uh, con considering your requisites, considering the things that you use to live your life. In, in general, it means being mindful and, and conscientious about how you live your life in terms of possessions, your environment. You could argue that this has to do with environmental conservation, but it, it more has to do with greed. Of course, it's the greatest killer of the environment anyway. Um, but like greed for clothing, beautiful clothing, greed for luxury, greed for food, junk food, food for the taste rather than for the nutri nutritive value. Greed for luxury and in, in accommodation, possession, wanting the best things, wanting beautiful things, comfortable, soft, pleasant things. All of this can lead to, to obsession, can lead to laziness, lead to complacency, pamada. This is why Buddhist monks have to live quite frugally because we're trying to ideal. Build this state of, of being free from something. Indulgence, that kind of thing. Because these not only do luxurious things cloud the mind with the pleasure that that comes from them and the greed and the, but but they lead to obsession, they lead to worry, they lead to concern, they lead to busy trying to attain and trying to keep and maintain the thing. Want all sorts of luxuries? Well, you've got to you've got to work for it.
So we got the um, we have to be mindful of the things that we use. The third is we have to be mindful of our livelihood, how we live our lives. So I said you have to go make a living. Well, even monks have to make a living, but we have to be conscientious about this. So part of morality is our livelihood. How do you make a living? Do you cheat people for a living? Do you kill for a living? Do you steal for a living? Supportive of suffering. This is an important part of morality because it, it worries it worries us. We feel guilty. We'll feel we'll be caught up in associating with people and, and situations that are unwholesome. A cause for unwholesomeness. And number four, the fourth one, is the the, the final one because it actually leads into the practice of concentration and that's guarding the senses. Highest, really the highest form of morality is guarding one's senses. Guard your senses, the rest of them will come by themselves. What does it mean by guarding the senses? It means the senses are our doors to reality. I think I talked about this a couple of weeks ago. It's an analogy is like a door that, that you let people in. And it's important to be careful who you let in. It's important that we be careful what we let in through the doors of the senses. If we let the doors of, of the senses give rise to liking, disliking, greed, aversion, then it will lead it, it, will, it, it will lead to well, and it prevents us from focusing, it prevents us from being collected in the mind, from cultivating a collected mind state. So this is where this is where meditation comes in. Once you start practicing meditation, then concentration comes. But the meditation is really about guarding the senses. So when you see, let it just be seeing. When you hear, let it just be hearing. My tradition will actually remind ourselves, see, see, there's something here. With it and trying to be mindful. So that our mind becomes collected, becomes focused. That's all for morality. The second one, concentration. Concentration in our tradition, and I guess it's most. I have what is called upachara samadhi and apana samadhi. So samadhi in general is about focusing the mind, and apana means you've attained perfect focus. Apana means attained or reached, entered into. So the concentration where one actually enters into a focused state, a trance state, really. A state where one has, one takes a single object and stays with that object and that object. And so this is a common sort of a concentration that comes from concept, like a color. When you practice loving kindness, focuses you on a single thing. Pachara Samadhi is also found in some of the meditation, or tranquility meditation, but it's, it takes a different object, or it takes different objects. It doesn't focus only on a single lasting concept that you can that you end upon. It focuses on things that are potentially changing. 
or it focuses on different things at different times, or it focuses on things that are not clear, not clearly defined. So there are certain tranquility practices that are samadhi, which means that upadachara means the the neighborhood or the area around. Chara means approaching, you approach. So apana is when you enter into something like entering in. Apana is the, the, the courtyard or the yes. approach. And it, it's rather than being fixed, it's it's more of a fluid, dynamic, flexible sort of mind uh, concentration. Where your mind can move from one object to another, but is still focused. Is able to be focused on on each thing for the time that it arises, for the time that it's experienced. And so that's the sort of meditation, the sort of concentration that we use in our tradition in, in vipassana meditation. We focus on something just for the time that it's there. So we'll say it's there, but then we let it go because it goes, it disappears. You have pain. Here, so you're jumping from one thing to another. This is an important type of concentration because it allows us to see nature. If you focus on a concept and go into a trance, you're not really seeing anything about nature. You're just pure in the mind, calm in the mind. It's a nice. It has nothing to do with the causes for your problems, the causes for your suffering. When instead you're flexible and looking at reality from moment to moment, concentrated on on your own experiences, and this has the potential to lead to the third training. So this is an important one. It leads to to wisdom. Wisdom will begin to arise. Now wisdom is of three kinds. I mean, these, these numberings are not the definitive enumeration, but they're a good, good way of understanding. So there's three kinds of what we could call wisdom. First kind of wisdom comes from thinking, uh, from, sorry, from hearing, studying, from having someone else tell you things. All of what I'm telling you now, if you didn't know about that, now you can say, oh yes, there are three types. There are three things we should train ourselves in. You could go to someone and say, well, as Buddhists, there are three things we should train ourselves in. And then you could rattle it all off. And people would say, oh wow, you're wise. And we might shake that off and say, oh no, no, I just heard this from someone. But nonetheless, it is wisdom that you passed on. It's not, in a sense, we would say it's not your wisdom, but... You know, to some extent it is. It's something that you know to some degree. To some degree, of course, you still don't know it unless you've realized it for yourself. That's, of course, the more important knowing, but you know the teaching. I mean, it's an important distinction to make because otherwise you, you, you hear something from someone, you say, oh yeah, I know that already. But you can know everything and know nothing, right? You can know the whole Tadidika, the whole of the Buddha's teaching and not understand any of it. Give a nod to that type of wisdom, but of course it's the most inferior, the most uh, base, and it's an inferior type of wisdom. It's still important. I mean, actually, we shouldn't underestimate the importance of that kind of wisdom. Because if you didn't hear about these things, the odds of you finding them on your own are pretty, pretty low. The second type of wisdom is from thinking. So whether you've heard something or whether you just come up with thoughts on your own, you start to think and ponder. And this is for all the philosophers, like all the philosophers who write their books. Many of those philosophers didn't do intensive meditation practice, but a lot of the philosophers had strong minds and were able to come up with all sorts of theories and ideas. I bet if you look at some of their lives, that they were actually, many of them, quite miserable. 
that you would see that not all of them were happy, not all of them were satisfied. The harder they are, the more miserable they were. They knew, but they didn't know. Or they came up with ideas that were actually wrong and were able to justify them. Minds they could argue quite well. So from thinking, I mean, for Buddhist meditators, even this thinking is important. It's important to think about your practice from time to time to say, hmm, okay, something's wrong here. I have to adjust this. Maybe I'm doing too much sitting meditation. I should do walking as well. And maybe I'm doing you know, too, too much walking, and so I should sit down. Or maybe I need to lie. I should try to eat less, try to sleep less, try to talk less, you know, start to analyze things. And so this is this kind of wisdom is important. It's important to have this sense of what's right and what's wrong, and the right way to go about things. And of course, just coming up with things uh, intellectually still isn't the same as really knowing them. So the final type of wisdom, and really the height, the pinnacle of all Buddhist practice is the wisdom that comes from actual experience. It comes from the practice of magnifying your experience, in a sense, bhavana. Bhavana means cultivation. So the idea is there are certain truths that are in, that are in the world around us. They're right under our nose. They're right in front of us. They're all around us. They're in everything we, everything we do, everywhere we go. They are there. These truths are there, but we can't see them because we're not focused. And so, this is the type of wisdom that comes from focus, from concentration. Where our minds are like a, a lens out of focus, and until you focus the lens, until you learn how to focus the lens to see clearly. Clearly, the things right under your nose you can't see. The things right in front of you are not comprehensible. And so that's really, in a sense, that's all meditation is. It's about clearing up the mind, it's about waking up, so that you can see things as they are, so you can see these truths of reality. Most importantly, the Four Noble Truths. What is suffering? What is suffering? What is suffering? What sorts of things are suffering? You say, what is the cause of suffering? What is it that's causing me to suffer? What am I doing to, to be able to see that? They'll be able to see that they're only suffering because of certain things. And when those things, are, those things cease, they don't suffer. And it's these three things that sort of set you on the fourth one, which is the right path path which leads to the cessation of suffering. So three things, three trainings that we undertake as, as Buddhists that I think are fairly universal. And I'm going to get an understanding of what Buddhism is. I think these three things are more or less essential. Hard pressed to go without them. So I imagine probably there is a Buddhist school that doesn't subscribe to them. And by far, these are sort of three things that are the pillars of Buddhism. That's my teaching for today. or type as it is.
Questions? Yeah. Thank you. It's good to see such a turnout of new people as well, people I've never seen. Okay. Have a good day.